This meeting is being recorded. Hello and welcome everyone for our quarterly webinar with uh, Helen Garrett and Leroy Rooker. And uh, today we'll spend an hour answering all of your questions. Having said this, please put your questions for Leroy and Helen in the chat and they will do um, their best to answer each question. If we do not answer all of your questions, uh, please do send them to Helen. Um, we will put Helen's email as well in the chat. You can also um, just uh, mention uh, activate, sorry, <laughs> uh, closed captions. And our uh, webinar is recorded and you will have access to the recording within 48 hours. And without any further ado, I would like to hand it over to Leroy and Helen. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Belma. Um, my name is Helen Garrett. I'm the University Registrar at the University of Washington and uh, have the great honor of being here with you with our fabulous Leroy. Uh, Leroy has uh, multiple decades uh, leading the former in the Department of Education's Family Compliance Office. So think of the main FERPA office that tells us how to interpret the law, but has been an incredible resource as a fellow um, with um, ACRO. So hello, Leroy, thank you for being here. Uh, anything else you wanna say about your background or introductions here? I think we just get into the question. Okay. So the, the reason why we all love a good Leroy and Helen show is that Leroy is the expert on the law and does a great job uh, as we want you to that each time you have a question or a scenario to think about what is it in the law and it's pretty basic that might guide you on how to respond and then I may um, come along and talk about how on a campus I might um, uh, enact what, what the answers are coming from Leroy. So um, we have uh, one question that was sent to us, but I'm going to start with a little story first, and then we'll go to um, Linda's question. So thanks for sending that in. And the way that this works, again, is you're going to just load up now, if you can, the chat. Um, in the hour, we'll probably get to about a third of the questions, and but I will make sure you have my personal email address at the University of Washington. And if you'll email me your question after, I'll answer every single one. And if I need help from Leroy, I'll go grab it. So I just want to say that every single day, as those responsible for compliance, as registrars, anyone, anyone seeing educational records directly related to a student and maintained by an institution are responsible to uphold FERPA. But every day something new comes up. And even for me, who's done this for a long time, uh, there's always something new. Yesterday afternoon, I received an email from someone in one department at the University of Washington who was on LinkedIn and saw that someone from um, one of our executive MBA program had posted 15 students' resumes right out on LinkedIn and said, hey, we're hoping you'll hire these people. So Leroy, if you were to think about what FERPA elements are there that someone sure. were to say, I saw this on LinkedIn, what would what things come to mind that you'd want folks to think about in, in terms of the law? Well, the key thing you want to think about is, did those students provide assigned consent? So this is an effort, to, sounds like, to help the students from an employment standpoint. Um, and you would have, this is just one where they put it on LinkedIn, but it's not an uncommon thing for institutions to have a, um, a, an office that is helping students from an employment potential employment standpoint. The thing when I'm on campuses, I always talk about is in that office, you can have, you have to have a consent in order to disclose those uh, resumes, for example, but you can do a single consent and disclose it multiple times because in FERPA, the uh, consent, the 99.30 uh, consent requirement when it lists what has to be included, um, the record to be disclosed, the purpose, and then the party or class of parties. So class of party there could be any uh, potential employer, and that's all it would need to say, and you could do that. But in order to put it on LinkedIn, you would need to have those uh, consents in place or any other disclosure. LinkedIn is just one, one vehicle. Yeah, yeah. So I uh, contacted the person that posted it and asked them to take them down while we stepped back to see if they did indeed have the releases. And then I asked to see what the language was on the releases. And it met what Leroy said, which is that the individual has said, you can publicly post my resume. 
But I did ask them that before putting it back up, just so they know that the university was being responsible, I gave a sentence that just says, for the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, students have given written permission to post this publicly so that anyone else seeing it knows that we're not violating FERPA. So great. All right, so let's get to the question. So thank you. So the first one comes from Linda. Um, you can read it, but we, we're familiar enough with this question that I think that I can summarize it, Leroy, for you to, to think about how to answer. So more and more, we are relying on third-party companies and software to do work that otherwise we have done. Um, but whether it's for current students or former students, um, when a student has an opt-out saying that we can't release their information, um, what, what do we need to think about to be able to give it to these third-party companies? It could be a career center or an alumni system um, in terms of the, the permission so that the student can't come back and say, hey, I had an opt-out, you shouldn't have shared it with Handshake. Um, and so what are the things under FERPA that, that folks should um, be thinking about? Yeah, so first thing you wanna think about is the, um, again, going back to what's the basis for sharing the information um, in this instance, if these contractors or vendors are doing something that the, your institution would ordinarily do and you've contracted with them, there's a provision in FERPA that says they could be school officials. So under 9931, uh, the A1 exception there to uh, sign consent, you they could be school officials. But in order to do that, you have to have direct control of the um, vendor and which means a contract that says here's what you can do you can't do anything else there are records essentially those kinds of things need to be in place in order to use that um, that outside party but you uh, definitely under FERPA can do that but it is still the responsibility of the institution that they are going to be um, compliant and not creating an issue for um, the institution. Because the thing to remember is if there's a violation or an alleged violation, the, de the department is not going to investigate a vendor. They're going to investigate the institution. You're responsible for your vendors. Right. Right. And really the spirit. I should also, I should also mention, sorry, Helen. Yeah. Um, Opting out of directory information, that's one of the exceptions to sign consent where you don't need uh, consent as long as you meet the um, those particular, um, the, the um, different, if you've an, uh, done your directory information notification, that sort of thing, you can disclose directory information, the student hadn't opted out, but it doesn't affect any kind of internal sharing of records. And in this instance, it would not, uh, as long as those vendors are under the direct control of the institution and are considered school officials, then um, it wouldn't affect uh, whether you could share that with them or not. It would all come down to, did they have a legitimate educational interest in, in the sharing? Yeah, and the best, thank you, Leroy, the best tip I can give you is at the point that students are placing or removing the opt-in or opt-out, use that as your educational opportunity to let them understand what that means. The intent was not to prevent companies that are otherwise doing work that we would have done from doing the job. It was to make sure that you weren't sharing to non-school officials and outside the student information that they've said that you can't. So um, where you can be as transparent as possible to say that we engage with systems to be able to do our work um, and, and let students understand what that means, it goes a long way for them to understand the difference between just sharing something without having that contract in place. So, all right, great first question, thank you. This next one, uh, Leroy comes from Katie and says, is use of FERPA records by internal faculty members for research not related to improving instruction governed primarily by institutions definition of legitimate educational interests and whether or not it includes research. So in this instance, um, it would be, there's an exception in FERPA that lets you disclose information um, for research purposes, but it has to be, uh, if, if you're, if the school official doing it, it needs to be on behalf of the institution. Um, 
and if um, legitimate educational interest is doing research and it's research that relates to that, then you could do that um, in, in this instance. But what you couldn't do is if I'm a school official and I want to do research not on behalf of the institution, so it's not the institution that's driving it, but it's me, maybe I'm working on my PhD and I want access, that is not permitted under FERPA because that's not, would not be a legitimate educational interest uh, and it's not on behalf of the institution. Right. And you get to make that determination. You don't have to turn anything over to anybody but the student. Um, so the key here is legitimate educational interests and need to know my way of looking at this, and we get a lot of requests for uh, doing research on our students, is does the requester need this to fulfill their job duties to the university? So getting back to what Leroy said, if it's not about that they won't be able to be get a paycheck and do their job, then you can measure it that way. But if it's for some other purpose, you have a right to say no, but I, I don't think that the law gives you in, information about whether it's improving instruction, that kind of thing. It's just you have to be able to justify it. Remember that if the student complains to the Department of Education or to your institution, you have to justify, we gave this information, these educational records, because we felt like this person was a school official, the gym educational interest to know they needed it to do their job. Um, so that would really be your barometer that you've measured that. All right, this next one's a nice easy one, um, but we love it. Our emails and phone calls, student records. So emails from one school official to another, if it's directly related. So remember the definition of an education record is it's directly related to the student. So the student's name, social security number, family member, something is in there, uh, student ID number, um, and it's being maintained by the institution or party acting for the institution. And a definition of a record includes electronic um, records. So those emails, if they are one um, from one school official to another at the institution is directly related to a specific student. If it's being maintained by the sender or the receiver, going to be an education record. Um, phone calls different in the sense that unless you're recording phone calls, because um, FERPA pertains to records, not to um, not to anything else. So if there's not a record on it, uh, now what you can't do in phone calls is, is um, make disclosures that are uh, of education records without um, that are improper. Um, you couldn't do that. That would be still by definition a disclosure. Yeah. And I have to be honest, after doing this for multiple decades, I was always calling them student records, but the technical word is educational records. And again, anything directly related to the student maintained by institution, it can also be communications between a school official and a student or anybody, um, school official and anybody, quite frankly, because as long as they're it's a, you can identify who the student is it's held on to. So your safest thing is to assume everything is and act that way with FERPA. Um, be thinking about where is this going, who can see, and how could I defend if the student were to register a complaint that it didn't go where it shouldn't. So your safest bet is to assume first it kind of is. Um, but uh, yeah, so that, that was a nice way. With phone calls, again, because they're not recorded, they're not a record, but there's kind of this adjacent conversation about still being sensitive about not having phones answered in a lobby where a lot of people can hear personal information about students. You might not be able to make a case that that's a record because it wasn't recorded, but there's a privacy element to just be sensitive to make sure that others can't also hear information. That's not so much FERPA, but it's a privacy issue. So do be thinking about who can be hearing these phone calls, not other team members or school officials, but general people. So great. Thank you. Okay. Do faculty need permission to allow a guest speaker into class? If not, why are they exempt? Yeah, basically, no. Uh, that's pedagogical. You bring someone in to do um, participate as a um, speaker in the class, then the you would not um, have a problem with that. If you're uncomfortable with it, you could always uh, include a um, line in your uh, and you notice when you describe school officials to say, including um, guest lecturers in a classroom. 
So yeah. you could you could cover it that way if you wanted to. All right. And again, a best practice is to certainly let the class know that an outsider is coming to class. Most classes, many classes are on Zoom now, so you might be able to see the names of who's attending. People can change a name if they don't want to be seen. You really shouldn't be sharing educational records in a classroom setting anyway, except that by simply seeing that someone's in the class. But in the 2009 FERPA made it that you can't be anonymous anymore to know who's in a class. So there's a certain amount of respect both for students as well as for the speaker to say, we're glad to have you here, but just know that we would you know, not want you to say who was in the classroom, that kind of thing. But yeah, so you can go ahead with that. Um, hi, Lori. Um, I'd like to know more about how power of attorney interacts with FERPA. Do specific powers of attorney allow an individual to request and receive student records on behalf of the student or the alum? Yeah, so power of attorney would, um, if it's, uh, it depends on what the power of attorney, what it says uh, in that power of attorney and what the power of attorney uh, covers. So if it is broad enough to cover education records or if it's specific enough to cover education records, then um, you could certainly disclose information from the student's education record uh, based on that. Do you have to do that? No, this is not the student. So this is someone acting in behalf and in the stead of the student, but they're not the student. The only party to whom you have to give access is the student. If you're uncomfortable with giving um, for whatever reason, or you choose not to, um, you don't have to honor that power of attorney, through, even if you're allowed to. Yeah, we at the University of Washington every year about this time and throughout the summer, we'll have the parents send in the power attorney saying you have to tell us anything we ask for the rest of the time the students here and we're like, no, we don't and we're not going to. Um, and so quite often we'll appeal to the student if they're well enough to attend the institution, they need to be able to communicate on their own to say we need to use our normal release of records processes to get whatever it is. And, and so we don't honor these at the University of Washington. It's, it's a may, not a must in, in FERPA. Um, so, Amy, um, with your question, do faculty need a FERPA to complete a letter of recommendation? I'm going to have Leroy answer that, but I want to caution us not to call things FERPA that are not FERPA. So maybe at your institution, FERPA means a release, um, but FERPA is the law as opposed to a release process. So I want to just maybe just for ease of the question you asked it there, but I can't tell you how many different ways people use FERPA in a way that's not quite dead on. It's the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. It is the law that guides us on how to uphold um, the, the requirements in it. So you probably need your institution some, um, I'm assuming with this question, do you need to have a release from the student? So yeah, go ahead there. Right, and the, and the answer to that is it depends. Uh, what does it depend? Is the information going to, um, another institution where the student seek your intending to enroll, you don't need a consent there. You can write a letter or a faculty member could um, that would go to that other institution if the student is applying there. So maybe they're applying to graduate school. They've asked the faculty member to write a letter. They don't need a consent to, to do that. Uh, and it doesn't, they can put anything in it. Uh, from education records as well, because there's the exception in FERPA that permits the forwarding of records to a school in which a student seeks or intends to enroll. On the other hand, if it's uh, maybe someone wants the letter of recommendation for a potential job, um, then it depends on what goes into that letter of recommendation. Does the letter of recommendation include um, this is this person was a wonderful student, always prepared, um, just dream student. You don't need a consent for that because there's nothing from education records in there. If on the other hand, you want to say the student um, was a very good student, but uh, wasn't always the best at showing up for class. That's from an education record, the fact that they weren't in attendance a good amount of time, or that they could have done um, a better grade-wise had they turned in papers, whatever it might be. If you 
if it's information from education records and it's going to other than a uh, school where a student seeks or intends to enroll, then you're generally going to need a consent. But if it's just talking about how great the, uh, the student, uh, what a great person, you don't need a consent for that. Yeah, I like to think of that if it's, it's just sharing observations because that's not something right. that is maintained. That's fine. I do guide our faculty to have a specific um, uh, request only to protect us because quite often they may cross over into talking about what is an educational record, but um, everything is uh, unicorns and rosy until the student doesn't get into law school, doesn't get the job, and then they come back and say, you didn't have a right to do that. So I encourage them just at least to have an email from the student saying, what is it that, that you're telling me I can release? And I also encourage faculty to try to stay away from things like grades and transcripts, let the transcripts speak for itself. So great question. Uh, all right, we love this question. It comes up every time, so it's a good yeah. one. Courses of different sections being merged in Canvas, is that a FERPA concern? How do you advise departments and instructors when merging Canvas courses or in your learning management system? Yeah, yeah so you always wanna, it, it always is a concern of, is this something that would be permitted? Is it the same course and just at a different time? And how does the institution view that? Uh, it's not something for the convenience of the instructor. Uh, so if it's not, um, if it's not um, the same course, just um, taught at different times, um, potentially you could do um, that merging, but if it's merging because the instructor um, wants to merge because it's easier for them, uh, that's not a legitimate educational interest there. So it's up to the institution how the institution defines that um, those course sections. Is this the same? Is this the same? Do you consider it uh, one? Um, one course, and if so, then the department said you could uh, you could merge those. But if it's something different, and it's just being done for convenience, that's not um, something you could do. Yeah. So Leroy, this is going to blow your mind. This one, next one. So, and I, I've got some intense thoughts about this. So it says, "I'm an AI assistant helping Bernadette take notes for this meeting. Follow along the transcript here." You'll be able to see transcripts of key moments, add highlights, et cetera. So um, my caution to all of you is to be sensitive to what is the meeting. Um, this one happens to be on Zoom. Um, if it were a classroom or if it was a faculty meeting, I might be concerned that there would be an AI um, in a recorded meeting, which becomes a record for the students, an educational record that there is an external entity that's that's capturing notes and passing it on. So I don't know, Bernadette, if you posted that for us to see that, if that just automatically showed up. I've never seen anything like that. Um, but I do want you to be really careful that in faculty meetings, if they're hitting record on a Zoom of a faculty meeting and they're talking about a student that is directly identified and that Zoom recording, that just became an educational record. So I don't know if you can see that. So what's interesting is it's telling us that it's it's capturing the, the webinar here, Leroy, and making a record and telling people that afterwards they can have access to it. So I, I don't know how that, what you think about, you know, FRIP is obviously technology agnostic, but I don't know if anything catches your eye about that one. Fascinating. Right, and um, yeah, and it is technology neutral and there are no um, education records involved in our webinar, so what um, what they um, so there's not going to be a FERP issue with that. Right. That but if we were in the classroom, it might be a little bit right. different. Or if we certainly were in a faculty or staff meeting talking about students, so you just have to be so careful that once that hit record and it exists, that that just became an educational record which a student has the right to access and has a right to register a complaint if they feel like it's been you know, shared inappropriately. So fascinating. Right. Thank you for that, Bernadette. Okay, Kristen, if a school lists photos as part of directory information, does this apply to all students, even if they're under the age of 18? So from a purpose standpoint, it does. I mean, it would be as long as they haven't opted out of 
directory information. The key piece there is if you're going to disclose photographs, that you have them listed as a directory information item. Because if you don't, then you, even though it could be, if you don't have them listed uh, and given the student the opportunity to opt out, then you would have to have consent in order to disclose those if the school is disclosing them. And certainly that last sentence, if they're under age 18, um, that would matter not if the student had uh, uh, enrolled at your institution, right? Right. So school, so rights belong to the student at a post-secondary institution, doesn't matter the student's age. Um, so you're always thinking about it from a standpoint of, of um, the, the rights belonging to the student. So anything that you do there, that's how you would view them. Now, you can always have state law. You could have state law that came into play there. I'm not aware of any that I can think of, but you could have state law that said you can't um, disclose the photographs of uh, any students at a post-secondary institution that are under age 18. Um, but it's not FERPA. That would be uh, your state law. You, know, you can always have a state law that affords greater protection um, than what FERPA does. You just can't have one that takes away. Yeah, great. So Lori um, has a, and I get tons of questions about commencement and recording right now and what can be shared and it's crazy. So here's one. What about a commencement speaker who talks about a student and connects it with a specific class they took? Is that something we should get consent from the named student prior to the speech or audition recording being made public? Yes, I mean, it, it really depends on the speaker so if this commencement speaker is not a school official so they're not part of the school and they're talking about the student as long as they didn't get the information from uh, education records or from an, a school official then whatever they say is not going to be um, subject to um, to FERPA now if it's being recorded and there's something there um, potentially, um, you could have uh, potential issue, and you may want to look at whether you want to edit the um, the recording if there's information in there, because at the point when you control, it's now an education record. If you record it and you maintain it as an institution, it's now an education record. So then you as an institution would have to look at that and say, is this going to run up against FERPA if we, uh, if we permit this um, information to stay in there, this discussion to stay in there? And that just depends on what the information is. Yeah. So I'm trying to remember if we answer the question about merging different classes into Canvas. I may have been going ahead, so I missed it, but we here's did. kind of, okay, we did, here's a follow, I thought we did, here's a follow up. If a faculty member wants to combine two sections of a class, is allowing students to form cross-section project teams or use a single message board to complete assignments requiring they post and reply to one another sufficient to establish need to know for the students in each section to see data for the others? Yeah, so if, if you've got, um, again, this is more pedagogical in nature. If you've got in the, uh, um, you've got the two sections of a class, you could, have um, cross-team projects. Um, you could use that single message board um, for all of them who are doing that that class project, for example. Um, and as long as that is all internal to the class, you'd be fine. Where the problem can come in is if you want to use it outside the classroom. Right. And, and really, um, again, with the 2009 updates that came along in terms of peer grading, students can see what each other are doing in terms of projects and sharing comments and thoughts and whatever it might be. What they can't see is a recorded grade of the other students. So um, I just wanted to just say, so they can be sharing information and, and crossing in the same class like this. But once there is a grade that's recorded, we had a situation um, uh, last week where a faculty member shared a team grade 
with the whole class. And because people knew the team and the class the grade had been graded, that actually wasn't appropriate because even though it was a group grade, they just outed what the grade was. So you want to just be careful with that with grading. Right. Okay, uh, Katie's got a question. Do institutions need student consent to provide identifiable student education records to the VA for VA compliance audits when those students are not VA benefit recipients? Generally, the answer would be yes to that. Now, I don't know if there is a separate because um, so VA and, and legislation affecting VA, VA benefits, that sort of thing. Um, I'm not familiar with that uh, to the extent that I could say whether there's anything in there that would um, override FERPA and, and um, require that. But as a general uh, rule, if you're just looking at audits, um, those audits would be um, in this instance, VA mm, compliance audit would be focused on um, VA and VA benefit recipients. Yeah, so I'm just looking at that one. I'm not sure why the VA would be interested in students who don't have um, right. benefits, but right. yeah, definitely when you've got an accreditation team coming to campus or the uh, state auditing um, entity or the Department of Education, Department of Defense, what it might be, you do want to turn that over and you'd be safe. Um, you just want to remember what Leroy said earlier, always and forever, we have to know where that we're in control of the records, where they're going and have some sense of will they be destroyed afterwards or returned. Sometimes we have to literally give access to our student information systems to auditors coming in. You just have to make sure someone closes the door behind them and takes away that access ever because we ultimately are the caretakers of where that information goes. We had two learners with the same name. Boy, does that happen at the University of Washington and sometimes dates of birth. Their name and ID were included on the program for scholarship awards event. What would you do? Um, and so I'm assuming, Connie, from your question that maybe um, you only meant to have one learner's name and so you release the other. Is that how you're reading that, Leroy? I'm not sure what the... I'm looking. Um... I just lost that one. Yeah, so it just says we had two learners with the same name, their name and ID, both of them were included on the program for scholarship awards event. What would you do? And I'm assuming that maybe one of them shouldn't have been, but because they had the same name, they were both listed. So it's sort of an accidental release if it was a scholarship awards event. Yeah, if it's, is this the one from Connie? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Uh, what would you do if the staff member inadvertently emails uh, a learner someone else's ID number? If you're disclosing information that requires a consent, then um, one of the things to do is obviously follow up with them to, to indicate that it was uh, a mistake and for them to delete that information. But the other piece is 99.32 uh, of the regulations requires that you um, do a recordation in an instance like this. Uh, so that's the recordation provision in FERPA and says you got to record when um, if, if um, a situation like this happens, you don't necessarily have to notify the student but you must record it in the student's education record so that they want to know who's had access to my uh, record, that that would be in there for them. Yeah. And I would say back to the scholarship awards event, you know, I'm assuming that's something in the past. So you can't go back and take back that people saw the two different names. Again, the most important thing is that you use it as an opportunity for training. Um, in our International Student Service Office, it happens quite frequently that they meant to send something to one student to the other. I like to use those opportunities as just a FERPA refresher to make sure that people are being extremely careful. Um, but again, if it was released in a way that was public, um, and like Leroy said, you don't have to tell the student. It's a good practice to do that if you're worried about what someone thinks, but you do have to make a note of that. And then I always, I always say, um, accidental release was remediated, including training for individual, just, just in case the student comes back and complains to the Department of Education. I've got that record to say we knew about it, we remediated it, and we provided training. 
Okay, because we kind of combined two Connie questions there, but that was good. Uh, will FERPA apply if a parent calls on behalf of their child to assist them with registering or deregistering for a course if students unable to do so? Example, student may be incapacitated, such as being hospitalized or committed. Um, if if they call for registering um, or even deregistering, if they call for that, um, you can um, take in any of the information that they uh, provide and take action according to that. Um, they're not asking in this instance, they're not asking for information. They're just saying uh, we need to register them. Um, and that's really up to the institution. Um, but also it may be um, more in depth in terms of what they are looking for or information that they might need from you. And so if the student is indeed incapacitated, um, hospitalized, what have you, that having uh, documentation on that would uh, be sufficient to let the institution um, deal with that. And it's quite possible that they're a dependent of the parent anyway. And so you've got that um, dependent student uh, provision, that exception to sign consent in FERPA that would also let you, um, without any kind of consent, disclose education records to the parents. If you've gone through a process um, with the student and the family to prove that they are dependents for tax purposes, got to be careful. Um, I have one of these in my mailbox today. Student was in a car accident yesterday and is in a coma and the student, and it's getting near the end of the quarter. So my standard is one, I wanna make sure I know for sure it's the right student, getting back to Connie's point about not mixing up names. Um, I require either a statement from the physician or a hospital social worker to say that the student is incapacitated and cannot drop their classes, and they have to give me date of birth and full name to make sure I've got the right student. I do go and make sure that there isn't a directory opt out because then it gets a little tricky because I've been asked by the student not to even tell the parents that they go here. So that becomes a new nuance. But then um, when we get that notification from the hospital or the social worker, we put a note in our student information system. We do drop the class, but we put a note that student was unable to impact their own um, dropping of classes. And we have that if the student comes back to say we shouldn't have done that. So, yeah. Okay, um, just looking at the clock, we've got about 20 minutes and 28 questions to go. So just a reminder um, for everyone, I'm going to um, ask you to make a note of this right now, if you don't mind. Here is my email address um, that I'm popping in. So if we don't get to your question, please um, do send me to me afterwards. and I will be glad um, to um, answer that afterwards. So um, okay, let's see, getting back up to the top. Um, Even calls over the phone. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, to confirm Thank a course me, from another um, university, um, can you release the information over the phone? You can release information over the phone if you have authenticated the identity of the the caller. So if it's the, someone who identifies as the student, what FERPA requires is that you have to authenticate the identity prior to any kind of disclosure. You have to give information to the student, but the student has to provide the documentation you require to know that it is the student. Uh, if you've got a, um, um, if you are, um, have institutional assigned email, you could always send the, say, we'll send the information to your institutional assigned email, for example. That way you can provide whatever information uh, and the authentication has already taken place for them to be able to get into the institutional email. Got it. Directory information, thank you, is limited only the mailing address for students who have provided only a home address with their admissions app. May we operate under the assumption that the home address and file is also their mailing address, for example, in other words, the one they the one in the same until such time a distinct mailing address is provided. Yeah, I mean, you you don't have to mince it that finely to, to uh, if you've got address um, in there, then you could use that. Uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, 
overthink that one. I think you'll be fine. Great. Hi, Rashida. How does FERPA apply to publication of Dean's List? Can we celebrate students publicly for those who have not opted out? Yes, we can. Absolutely. As long as you've got honors and awards listed as a director information item, then you can disclose the information um, yeah. of who has made, um, gained the honor. We actually just had to create a dean's list name because there were people that were complaining that we were providing either their student record name or their preferred name, and it was outing them because it was a public list. So be sensitive to the fact of what name you're producing and if your students are going to be okay with that. So that's not a FERPA thing, just a warning there. Is it enough to have the career services post a notation that says by posting your resume, you're consenting to release of information, or do you need a signed written consent? Signed consent. Got to have 931. You have to have the signed consent. There's there's signed consent in FERPA and there's exceptions to signed consent. There's not an implied consent other than for directory information disclosure. <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy, Amy. I was in a student information system meeting when an employee logged into the student portal of their child ah, and showed everyone in the room, including a vendor, their child's academic information. We do not have release of information for the employee to show their child's information. Is this a violation of FERPA? If so, do you have any recommendations on how it should address the issue? So, uh, <laughs> so much wrong here. <laughs> yeah. So they logged in, they used the student's access to get in um, it, to the portal because it was a student portal, it's not a staff right. portal. So they were already stepping in by using the student's credentials and then they showed everyone in the room, including the vendor, the student's educational records without the student's written permission. Right. Is this a violation of FERPA? That would not be permitted under FERPA. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, you, that's where you have to just be very cautious when you're... Uh, in a situation like that, but that's not something that um, you don't want to be in a situation where you are sharing information outside of the party that's supposed to be receiving the information. Right. So what would I do? I would immediately go in and um, just uh, uh, undo the student's PIN or access to the system. And I would write to the system and say that a parent was able to access your records, which meant you shared your confidentially known only to pen. So go in and reset it and don't do that again. And then I would have a gentle conversation with the perhaps well-meaning colleague to not do that. Um, but this is an this is a release. And so technically there should be a recordation in the student's record that educational records were shared without their permission. So wow. be gentle and kind because they didn't mean to do bad, but you do need to make a, an example, but you've got to get to the student and tell them to choose a new, um, known only to them, confidential password or pen and not to share with their parents again like that. And that's, I use that as a, a FERPA literacy moment for sure. Right. And, and it was one of those instances where the, the, um, I'm guessing the student gave that away now because they're an employee, they might've had a way to get it without the student giving it to them. And that's, that would be another problem if they yeah. were able to do that and had that kind of access where they could get, um, yeah. the, and, the credentials to log into a, a student, any student's record. That is not a legitimate educational interest and a need to know, and it's actually not okay. And hopefully you have institutional um, access and policy um, uh, regulations out there for your, from your IT folks and not allowing that. How does FERPA apply to the posting of a 4.0 GPA grade in a commencement program or announcement during commencement? Is release some information required? And I think the key here is that by saying they have a 4.0, you're actually giving their specific GPA. Um, but again, it depends on there if you have, um, by definition, let's say, um, President's Honor Roll uh, for 4.0 students, you can disclose that if you've got under honors and awards. Um, if you're unsure about that or don't have that, um, then um, sign consent's always a good option. But ordinarily with honors and awards, um, if you have that category, um, and it because ordinarily you're not gonna give uh, the GPA, but some institutions have that um, their highest um, 
honor there is for those 4.0 students. And if that's the case, you can do that as long as they haven't opted out. Yep. A student walks into the office and asks for a copy of the transcript from another institution or high school transcript. Are we required to make copies? Should they complete a request form that they are specifically listing the item being copied and sign the form? So it's up to you as an institution whether you would, uh, one, provide them a copy, um, period, or also whether you'd provide them a copy of a transcript from another institution. You aren't under FERPA. What you're required to do as an institution is provide the students the opportunity to inspect and review their education records. You're not required to provide copies unless not providing a copy would effectively deny access to inspect and review. So for that student, you could say, well, we can show you the transcript, but we won't make you a copy of it because we don't make copies of a transcript from another institution, for example. Um, and you'd be fine. Uh, or if you want to give it to them, then um, you wouldn't even need to have them fill out a consent form because it's to the student. You just want to know it is the student. Right. So what's key here is if you have held on to a transcript or from a high school or another institution, it is now an educational record because it is directly related to the student and maintained by the institution. But Leroy's point is you don't have to turn it over to them. And best practice would say you wouldn't because what if it's changed from the sending institution, but you can't deny them the ability to see it. That is where something like Zoom can be your friend because you can bring it up and show it to them. Now, could they take a picture or something? They could. But um, so just keep in mind that that if you if it's directly related and you're holding on to and maintaining it, it is subject to FERP as an education record. So, Okay. How long should learner email accounts and college web portals be kept active once the learner has not returned to the institution? In the eyes of FERPA. So um, I yeah. would like, I'll defer to you on that one, Helen, because that's a practice, not a, there's, there's not a FERPA issue there, really. That was the key, right? Yes. So that is absolutely an institutional decision at the University of Washington. After uh, two quarters of not being here, we don't um, provide access to systems anymore just because it becomes onerous. However, if a student were to come and ask to see what was in their record before they left, they're still subject to FERPA, even though they're a former student, they have a right to see that. But there isn't, um, remember 1974, 50 years ago, uh, FERPA didn't know anything about portals. So that's lucky for us. Um, so in terms of FERPA, there wouldn't be anything in the law about that. Um, but you just want to be thinking about the longer you hold on to information that you no longer need, that you don't have to retain, the, the more um, you're going to have to show to people and share and comes up in lawsuits and things. So just be thinking about that. Yeah. And, and that is one of the things that, that um, you want to, um, you want to think about is, and this is what, when I'm on campus is doing training, I'm always talking about this, have a records retention policy, but have a records destruction policy. The longer you keep whatever is in that web portal, uh, even if student can't get to it, if they want to see it, you always have a FERPA liability for as long as you are maintaining it. And that liability is protect the privacy of it and give the student access to it at any point. So if they come back years later and want access and you still have it, that's your FERPA liability. Yeah, there's actually no reference to records retention or schedules in the law, um, but it's a best practice and you just want to think about what Leroy said. Okay, next question. Referring to emails as education records being maintained, what is maintained? Maintained is any way you, uh, you would keep them. So a record, so you look at the definition of a record in FERPA and it is includes electronic records uh, by definition. Um, and so that email, if it's being maintained by the sender or the receiver, doesn't mean they have to be printed out any more than you would have to print out your student information system. Your student information system is all electronic, but it's still an education record because it's being maintained. You're Once keeping it. Right. And once a student makes a request to access their records, it's against the FERPA law to destroy those records once that request is known. So we have to tell faculty and staff that if you're communicating on your phone by texting or signal otherwise, 
that just became a record maintained, you're a school official and you've got to be able to produce it. So it's another reminder to make sure that when records don't need to exist anymore per your retention schedule, you're getting rid of them because if they're there, they're there. It doesn't matter the medium. What about giving educational records to advancement and they say it is needed to inform how they talk with student parents as they solicit donations? Similarly, what about scholarship gifters who request successful progress use of their scholarship funds? So two different questions there, but yep. first, let's take them one at a time. The first one um, is the advancement office. Are they um, are these institutional employees or is this a separate entity? If it's a separate entity, it gets treated very differently than if they are school officials. If, there's, if they are employees of the institution that are running the advancement office, then depending on how their request fits within your legitimate educational interest and legitimate educational interest is not just the interest of the student, but it's the interest of the institution as well. So you could uh, potentially um, give them the information that they're requesting. But again, if it's not, if it's a separate uh, 501c3 or something, um, then they're no different than anyone else. Uh, they just happen to be helping you out, but they would not be they're not if it's not school officials who run it then um you would need to limit what you um what you share with them um and then the second question that scholarship um gifters who want to know the progress uh as far as their, their scholarship funds if you can um well two things to look at here one is uh this would generally fit under the financial aid exception to be able to disclose information, but it depends on what the application looks like that the um, student signed in order to get the scholarship. So if that scholarship says that the um, scholarship provider will be uh, provided information on the uh, your progress, something to that effect, then that is um, that uh, permits the institution to disclose that kind of information to the, um, the scholarship provider. If on the other hand, it isn't or the student didn't apply for it, they, but they're the recipient of it, it you would have to look at, um, again, the financial aid. It has to be, in order to use financial aid exception, it says it's for uh, determining the uh, amount of the aid, the whether they're eligible for the aid, and also enforcing terms and conditions. So that's where you have to look at what are the terms and conditions. Right. Okay, maybe one more question here. If we receive an email from an individual requesting directory information on our current students, can we release that information to an individual since it's only directory information? I'm looking for that. Okay, if we receive. At 11, 16 a.m. If we receive an yeah. email so asking for direct information, can they release it since it's only directory information? Yeah. So you get um, any request for directory information, you may, you're not required to, you may disclose that. If you get the email and you're not comfortable with that under FERPA, you don't have to disclose that. Now, you may have to, if they come with a uh, open records request and your state law um, is such that it would require you to disclose directory information on those students that uh, haven't opted out. But directory information for any student who hadn't opted out under FERPA, you have, um, it's, it's really up to the institution how they want to treat those. That's right. But, but um, yeah, so this, that, that may not must. So just um, be discerning right. about who's asking and just you better make sure that at the moment that you're turning that information over that in the last 24 hours, a student hasn't opted out of directory information. So a lot of people on our campus don't even know how to check and see if someone has opted out. And I said, if you cannot see with your own eyes in any given moment, whether someone is opting in and out, you must give out nothing because you risk giving out information without knowing that they have since done the opt-in, opt-out. So um, we're at the top of the hour. We've got about four minutes left. And I did uh, put in my email address, helenbg at uw.edu. Um, we are so grateful that you attended today. Um, 
keep coming back uh, when you see the webinars uh, coming up there. But remember, um, your best bet is to always um, just step back and look at the law and see what um, your options are. Um, and then don't forget that there are resources um, to have people like Leroy come and do training on your campus out on the APRA website. Um, we want to be a resource for you. Um, and I love answering questions anytime. And I know where I stop and where Leroy starts in terms of going to him if I need more answers. So turning it back over to you, Belma, um, for any last words. Thank you, everybody, for the applause. Yeah. I love Excellent that. Job. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, Leroy. And thank you all for joining. So the webinar, as I said, is recorded. And uh, I will make sure that it is available by the end of tonight. And uh, if you would like to watch it or share it with your colleagues, please do so. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everyone. Yeah. Thank you for being here. Thank, thank you, you, Leroy. Good to see you. Thanks, Thanks Belma. Thank Bye-bye, everybody.